Okay, we have started recording. I hope everybody had a wonderful break. Um, I was quite busy um, most of the week. But we are back and we are finally completed with the class struggles in France 1848-50. to 50. It was a very enlightening and interesting read. And we got the first taste of Marx bringing up the concept of the dictatorship of the proletariat. Now, we are going to read in quick succession four different short pieces wherein uh, Marx and Engels both talk about um, the dictatorship of the proletariat. We are skipping one piece, the civil war in France. And there's another that we will likely bring up, also related to France, later. But in the meantime, I want to get through this shorter stuff more quickly. So today we will try to get through Marx's letter to Wedemeyer, March 5th, 1852. And I will share this um, to anyone with the link to have a commenter ability. And it is in the ESVC text. We'll read through this right quick. It's only three pages. But then we've got the speech on the seventh anniversary of the International. This was right here. Um, it's going to be also, it's going to be two pages. And then the conspectus on Bakunin, statism, and anarchy. I did not bring it over to a uh, Google Doc because it's got a bunch of quotations which you need to go over. And then finally, the program on the blankest fugitives from the Paris Commune. This one is written by Ingalls. Um, and it is eight pages in total. Well, more like seven pages in total. And as a re recollection, blankism was essentially the concept of a group of militant and secretive people who would do all the revolutionary actions, assassinate leaders, and so on and so forth, and um, do the revolution on behalf of the people outside of the people. And this is criticized heavily by all communists. Our movement is within the people, not outside them. Um, Lenin had more to say about them, and I'm sure others did too. However, we are going to start with the letter to Wedemeyer in 1852. So, dear Wewe, I'm afraid that there's been a bit of a muddle because, having misunderstood thy last letter, I addressed the last two packages to Office of to, of the Revolution, 7 Chambers Street, Box 1817. What caused the confusion was that damned Box 1817, since you've been written telling me to append this to the old address without drawing any distinction between the first address and the second, but I hope the matter will have resolved itself before this letter arrives. The more so since last Friday's letter contained a very detailed fifth installment of my article. This week I was prevented from finishing the sixth, which is also the last one. If your paper is appearing again, this delay will not prove an obstacle since you will have an ample supply of material. Your article against Heinzen, unfortunately sent to me too late by Ingalls, is very good, at once coarse and fine, and this is the right combination for any polemic worthy of the name. I have shown this article to Ernst Jones, and in close you will find a letter from him addressed to you, intended for publication. Since Jones writes out illegibly and with abbreviations, and since I assume that you are not yet an out-and-out -out Englishman, I am sending you, along with the original, a copy made by my wife, that would be Jenny Marx, who helped edit um, Marx's pieces, and was an all, all told outstanding woman. Together with the German translation, you should print them both, the original and the translation, side by side. Below Jones's letter, you might add the following comment. As to George Julian Hardy, 
Likewise, one of Mr. Heinzen's authorities, he published our Communist Manifesto in English in his Red Republican, with a marginal note describing it as, quote, the most revolutionary document ever given to the world. End quote. And in his Democratic Review, he translated the words of, quote, wisdom brush aside by Heinzen, namely my articles of the, on the French Revolution from the Revue de the paper that Marx is publishing a paper on Louis Blanc he refers his readers to these articles as being the quote true critical examination of the French affair by the way in England there's no need to have no need to have recourse only to extremists if in England a member of parliament becomes a minister he must have himself re-elected thus Drusselli the new chancellor lord of the exchequer writes his constituent on 1st March quote we shall endeavor to terminate that strife of classes which, of late years, has exercised so pernicious an influence over the welfare of this kingdom. End quote. Whereupon the Times of 2nd March comments, quote, If anything would ever divide classes in co this country beyond reconciliation and leave no chance of a just and honorable peace, it would be attacked on foreign corn. End quote. Unless a ignorant man of character like Heinzen should suppose that the aristocrats are for and the bourgeoisie against the corn laws because the former want monopoly and the latter freedom your worthy citizen sees opposites only in this ideological form we shall content ourselves with saying that in england in the 18th century the aristocrats were for quote freedom of trade and the bourgeoisie for monopoly Precisely the same attitude as is adopted by two classes in present-day Prussia against the corn laws. There is no more rabid free trader than new than the um that is Ger that is Marx's um publication to my knowledge. Finally, if I were you, I should tell the Democratic gents in general that Villet would do better to acquaint themselves with bourgeois literature before they yap at its opponents. For instance, they should say the historical works of Thierry, Guzot, John Wade, and so forth, in order to enlighten themselves as the past history of the classes. They should acquaint themselves with the fundamentals of political economy before attempting to criticize the critique of political economy. For example, one need only open Ricardo's magnum opus to find on the first pages the words with which he begins his preface, quote, The produce of the earth, all that is derived from its surface by the united application of labor, machinery, and capital, is divided among three classes of the community, namely the proprietor of the land, the owner of the stock of capital necessary for its cultivation, and the laborers by whose industry it is cultivated. End quote. Now, in the United States, bourgeois society is still far too immature for the class role to be perceptible and comprehensible. Striking proof of this is provided by C.H. Carey of Philadelphia. Quote, the only North American economist of any kind. He attacks Ricardo, the most classic representative of the bourgeoisie and most stoical component of the proletariat as a man whose works are an arsenal for anarchists and socialists, for all enemies of the bourgeois order. He accuses not only him, but also Malthus, Mill, Say, Torrens, Wakefield, McCullough, Senior, Whateley, R. Jones, etc. Those who would lead the economic dance in Europe of tearing society apart and of paving the way to civil war by showing that the economic bases of the various classes are such that they will inevitably give rise to a necessary and ever-growing antagonism between the latter. He tries to refute them, not, it is true, like the famous Heinzen, by relating the existence of classes to the existence of political privileges and monopolies, but by seeking to demonstrate that economic conditions, rent, landed property, cap profit, capital, and wages, wage labor, rather than being conditions of struggle and antagonisms, are conditions of association and harmony. All he proves, of course, is that the undeveloped, quote-unquote, Relations in the United States are, to him, normal relations. This is, um, this is actually a very good quotation right here. You see this very often. Oh, yes. It's, uh, 
it's, um, you know, rent and profit and wages are just, they're natural. There, there's nothing unnatural about them. These are harmonious. When one need merely look and say, uh, no, the fact that the proletariat has a fight for higher wages necessarily makes us unnatural and non-harmonious. Continuing. Now, as for myself, I do not claim to have discovered either the existence of classes in modern society or the struggle between them. Long before me, bourgeois historians had described the historical development of its struggle between the classes, as had the bourgeois economists their economic anatomy. My contribution was, one, to show that the existence of classes is merely bound up with historic, certain historical phases in the development of production. Two, that the class struggle necessarily leads to the dictatorship of the proletariat. Three, that this dictatorship itself constitutes no more than a transition to the abolition of all classes into a classless society. And we are following that. Ignorant Lao, such as Heinzen, who deny not only the struggle but the very existence of classes, only demonstrate that, for all their blood thirsty mock humanist yelping, they regard the social conditions in which the bourgeois is dominant as the final product, the non plus ultra of history, and that they themselves are simply the servants of the bourgeoisie, a servitude which is the more revolting, the less capable are the Lao to grasping the very greatness and transient necessity of the bourgeois regime itself. Select from the above notes whatever you think fit. By the way, Heinzen has adopted our centralization in place of his federative republic. When the views on classes we are now disseminating have become familiar objects of, quote, sound common sense, then a scoundrel will proclaim the loud as the latest product of his own sanctity and yap his opposition on our onwards progress. Thus, in the light of his own sagacity, he yelped at uh, he yapped at Hegelian philosophy so long as it was progressive. Now he feeds on its stale scraps, spat out undigested by Rouge. Herewith also the end of the Hungarian article. It is all the more essential that you should try to make some use of this, assuming your paper exists, because Sezmir, the erstwhile Prime Minister of Hungary, now in Paris, has promised me to write a long article for you, signed with his own name. <laughs> and your paper has come into being. Send more copies so it can be distributed more, more widely. Yours, Karl Marx. Okay, so what did we learn here real quick? We learned that Marx sees his primary contributions to socialism being to understand the relationships between the historical phases and the development of production, leading to the existence and the basis of classes, then understand the historical development that will necessarily lead to the dictatorship of the proletariat as the proletariat, as the final class, develops its own power and ultimately brings a class struggle to its fruition, which is its uh, negation. And then, that this dictatorship itself constitutes no more than a transition to the abolition of all classes and to a class of society. That would be the negation right there. In addition, um, there are some interesting things here, you know, you know, stuff that we're all very familiar with, like, for example, this guy who's ultimately just saying, no, classes don't exist, or yeah, either it's classes don't exist, or these class relations are natural, and, and so on and so forth. And also, for the sake of education, both of us and any bourgeois consciousness they should you know study the history of classes so that they can actually critique political economy and then they can critique the critique of political economy as well that is a necessary duty in education so this has been an interesting little bit 
but we are going to move on to the next one.